Hi there. Two weeks ago, the first casting sheets started going out for the Game of Thrones prequel TV series House of the Dragon, which is about the great civil war between two rival branches of House Targaryen known as the Dance of the Dragons. The first leaked casting calls were on the leaders of the two rival factions, Rhaenyra Targaryen and her stepmother Alicent Hightower. Well, the next big casting sheet just leaked out for Daemon Targaryen, Rhaenyra's uncle and husband and the main military leader of her faction. Daemon is the younger brother of Rhaenyra's father, King Viserys I. Daemon Targaryen. Wow. A hero and a villain in equal measure. The proverbial rogue prince. You know, my words fail. Let me have George R. R. Martin himself introduce Daemon, that Martin recorded a promo video for the Fire and Blood prequel collection book when it came out, in which he described Daemon and why he's probably his favorite Targaryen in it. You know, I'm notorious for my love of gray characters. And one of the grayest characters in the entire history of Westeros is Daemon Targaryen, the Rogue Prince. Uh, we, we took one of the sidebars and made a separate story out of it, the Rogue Prince. Daemon is the younger brother of King Viserys I. For a time, he was the heir to the throne when Viserys had no children. And then Viserys started having children, and he, he stopped being the heir to the throne. He's a notorious bad boy, a rogue in every sense of the word. Uh, he was a rival for his own niece, Rhaenyra, and then later he became the husband of Rhaenyra. He switches sides several times. You never know what side he's going to come down on. He's a very colorful and unpredictable character, and um, I think he has to rank up there as my favorite. Martin wrote out the entire history of House Targaryen for the World of Ice and Fire sourcebook, which came out back in 2014, and he wrote them out as a series of novellas, but by the time he finished, there was no way all of this could fit into the world book. So they were sitting in his desk for a couple of years, but fans kept saying, you know, you finished so much, can you release more of this information? You're just sitting on it. So over time, he started releasing sample chapters from these unpublished notes, starting with The Princess and the Queen back in actually 2013. It came out a year before the world book, but he had written them for the world book as sidebars, sidebars that grew into 60,000 word novellas. So the first one was The Princess and the Queen in 2013, and that starts on page one, The War Begins, when Viserys I dies and the succession war breaks out that later that day. So you dive right into the combat, it goes right into it, and you kind of have to hit the ground running because he tried his best in the short novella release to quickly explain, okay, this is who this character is, this guy is this guy's brother, this is his cousin, but you jump right in and it's a, a big info dump really fast. The issue being he never intended it to be read that way, that he said... I'm releasing this out of order, I'm giving out a sample of, okay, this is when the fighting actually began. But he said, you know, when I wrote these starting with the Targaryen Conquest and going chronologically, he said, I skipped over all the setup parts. Because he wanted people to be interested in, okay, let's skip to the cool fighting stuff. Then about a year later, he released the next prequel novella, which chronologically came before that, titled The Rogue Prince because it followed the career of Daemon Targaryen and his various court intrigues and adventures, and also following the rise of Rhaenyra from her birth through her father's 30-year reign, explaining, well, why did two rival court factions develop around Rhaenyra and around her stepmother that eventually led to war? It is a short novella. It's drastically shorter than The Dance of the Dragons, but it covers 30 years, with time skips, you know, it starts with, and then Rhaenyra was born, and then three pages later, and then she's 16, and this was her first love, and then they had an affair, and then five pages later, she's 25. So it, it covers a lot of time, but it's an outline. You see, they're written as in-universe history books. So a TV show could expand this out a lot, and this, there's at least one season's worth of material in The Road Prince. And... When House of the Dragon was first announced, Martin even outright said, you know, it's going to be based on the Dance of the Dragons. If you want to get 
a head start on this, you should start reading The Rogue Prince and The Princess and the Queen if you haven't already. And I saw some people worry that, oh no, now we have to track down these short stories that are in anthologies and other things. No, no. All of the prequel novellas were collected together in one hardcover titled Fire and Blood, which came out in November 2018, that you don't need to hunt down the original Rogue Prince. The version of it, it was turned into a chapter in Fire and Blood, but it was expanded with new information. That it, the editors had cut out a couple of pages worth of info from it when it was in, in the anthology of someone else's work. And he wrote a few new things for it, checking his notes. So the fully expanded, revised version with all the info in it, the definitive version is Fire and Blood. You don't need to track down Rogue Prince anymore or Princess and the Queen. If you want to get into reading this to prep for the, the show... Fire and Blood is a 700-page hardcover. It isn't going to be one TV show. It never was supposed to be. Martin always said there's like 20 TV seasons worth of content in this thing. It's an outline for multiple prequel ideas. So if you want to get started in this, get Fire and Blood, which just came out in paperback, actually. The paperback release just came out with new artwork in it. And it starts roughly at the midpoint of Fire and Blood, the chapter on the Great Council of the Year 101, when his brother Viserys I becomes king, starts right there and then moving onwards. Roughly the middle is where this TV show is going to be starting, because before that was an 80-year-long era of peace where not that much happened that would be in a TV show. So that's where the Rogue Prince is now. If you want to get onto reading that, I really recommend you do, because there's a lot of content. And hooray, this whole TV show is based on a finished book. We know how it ends. There's not going to be, well, we're going to have to make up stuff. You know, it's an outline. It's not fully narrativized, not all of it has dialogue. But we know the major plot beats, and we know it's a good story. Well, the introduction of the Rogue Prince novella, and now the introduction of the first chapter of it in, in Fire and Blood, really sums up Daemon well. Quote, Over the centuries, House Targaryen has produced both great men and monsters. Prince Daemon was both. In his day, there was not a man so admired, so beloved, and so reviled in all Westeros. He was made of light and darkness in equal parts. To some he was a hero, to others the blackest of villains. No true understanding of that most tragic bloodletting known as the Dance of the Dragons is possible without a consideration of the crucial role played before and during the conflict by this rogue prince. Daemon Targaryen is, well, Elio and Linda of Westeros.org, who co-wrote the World Book with Martin, they have openly described Daemon as basically a Targaryen version of Oberyn Martell, who rides a dragon. And that comparison makes a lot of sense, that, you know, the later Martells have some Targaryen blood in them through intermarriage, so Oberyn Martell is actually a direct descendant of Daemon Targaryen. Heck, back in Season 5, when they made that 20-minute animated histories and lore video on the Dance of the Dragons, they even brought back Pedro Pascal the Oberyn Martell actor, to narrate the parts focusing on Daemon, which was no perfect. I mean, his, his character had died the season before. He came back just for the Blu-rays, just to do the voiceover narrating the Daemon parts. That was great. Daemon Targaryen is the best warrior and military commander of his generation, honorable in his way to his friends, and capable of great acts of courage and audacity, but this alternates with him sometimes doing really horrible things that are indefensible. He is mercurial. Uh, to bring up Stannis Baratheon, you know, like how people are divided on, well, Stannis killed his own brother Renly. Well, Stannis would say, well, I had reasons. Renly betrayed me. And, well, you still shouldn't kill your own brother. That There's points where Daemon does really controversial things, or at times just, flippant, random things that, why did you do that? What sense did it even make to do that? Because he, he's ruled by his passions and impetuous. He doesn't think far ahead at times. Though at other times, he has really good long-term strategies. It's just, it's the moods that rule him. So, Which makes it great, because it's about gray characters. The Dance of the Dragons is so awesome, because it isn't the Honorable Starks versus the cunning and scheming Lannisters. It's tonally more like Stannis Baratheon versus Olenna Tyrell. 
that they're not really clear heroes or villains. It's, it's politics with flawed characters. And in many ways, Oberyn Martell, and particularly Daemon Targaryen, who one was actually based on the other, it's let's make a Targaryen version of Oberyn, both of them really fit the trope of what's called a Byronic hero, after the works of Lord Byron, a major figure of Romanticism, uh, Romantic with a capital R, the Romantic period, that brooding literary phase of self-reflection in the mid-1800s after the Napoleonic Wars, where you'd have jaded social exiles musing on ancient ruins and contemplating society's downfall from a bygone age, the Romanticism period of literature. George R. R. Martin is a big fan of that whole genre. But how do we specifically describe a Byronic hero? Uh, here's some quotes to help illustrate that. Quote, A man proud, moody, cynical, with defiance on his brow and misery in his heart, a scorner of his own kind, implacable in revenge, yet capable of deep and strong affection. These guys are so much of an anti-hero that they lean into being anti-villains. Okay, Another good quote here. Charismatic, passionate, idealistic, but deeply flawed individuals who may act in ways that are socially reprehensible and definitely contrary to mainstream society. A Byronic hero is on his own side, his own values, which he won't bend or change for anyone, but he's left brooding over internal conflicts. And that sums up Daemon Targaryen well. He's the wonder of his age, skilled at everything he applies himself to. Well, to give a brief overview of Daemon's background, as the younger brother of the king, he started out being shuffled around between various positions on the small council, but he really found himself when he created the modern city watch. Remember, King's Landing was a boom town that the Targaryens had made only one century before. It mushroomed in size really fast, haphazardly, so it was terribly organized that their guardsmen just grew hodgepodge randomly here and there over time. It, there wasn't an overall plan for them. So the city police was little more than a mismatching set of temporarily hired goons, poorly equipped, poorly trained. They were thought of as a joke. The, 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 you didn't really think of it as a career, that you got hired temporarily as just the goon squad and with, with some clubs or something. It was Daemon who turned them into a real professional organization, well-trained and well-equipped with standardized weapons and standardized uniforms. He literally gave them their gold cloaks to wear with pride, you know, we are the guardsmen of King's Landing, so that 200 years later, during the time of Game of Thrones, you know, the City Watch are commonly called the gold cloaks, like the coppers, you know, oh, hey, go, run, get the gold cloaks, oh, the gold cloaks are here. Well, it was Daemon who gave them their gold cloaks, and they loved him for all he did. But he wasn't some strict law and order type of guy, no. He organized the city's police force, then used it to basically take over all the organized crime in the city. You know, crime overall went drastically down, and but what little was left he controlled. He was called the Lord of Flea Bottom. Flea Bottom is the largest slum district in King's Landing. He liked to wet his beak in everything. Gambling, prostitution. He drank for free in every tavern in the city, and enjoyed every whore for free too. So as you see, in his youth, Daemon was the pride and scandal of King's Landing in equal measure. His followers loved him, he ruled the police and the underworld, but eventually all this you know, scandalous rabble-rousing, it, it upset the royal court so much, all the lords at court, that they really pressured his brother. He can't keep being like this. So reluctantly, his brother say, I have to remove you from the small council. The other lords won't keep putting up with all this going on you're doing. One of the chief voices in removing Daemon from the royal court was Otto Hightower, Alison's father, who went on to become Hand of the King himself. Otto and Daemon would remain bitter rivals for the next three decades. But for now, young Daemon's response to being removed from office was basically, Oh yeah? Then I'll make my own kingdom! With blackjack and hookers! He linked up with Lord Corliss of House Valarian, commander of the royal fleets, 
who was having problems with pirates who had taken over the island chain at the entrance of the narrow sea, known as the Stepstones, which are basically their version of the Caribbean. It was holding all trade coming into King's Landing through the, this island chain. So with Lord Valarian's ships, Daemon raised a mercenary army, and over the course of the nine-year-long pirate wars, he carved out his own kingdom in the Stepstones, cobbled together from corsair towns and pirate dens that he had subdued. And he got into, for nine years, he got into all of these swashbuckling adventures fighting pirates until he was the greatest warrior of his generation. And these adventures take up most of the action parts of the Rogue Prince novella. That if this is season one of House of the Dragon, there would be action scenes in the first season. They'd be fighting pirates and things. And his brother, the king, didn't even mind all of this. You know, Viserys went, it's good that he's playing at war against pirates. It keeps him out of trouble back at home. And, you know, it's helping stop the pirate problem. So he even sent him gold to, you know, help fund his activities there. And this lasted for years through a string of adventures. I'm not going to summarize all of it. But the short version is that the southern free cities like Lys and Myr eventually rallied against Daemon's incursions on their territory and then allied with independent Dorne to the west to hit him from two fronts until they eventually wore down his forces and, after separate intrigues at the royal court called him back, he abandoned the enterprise altogether. Leading the armies in the free cities that eventually ousted him was the outlandishly flamboyant corsair for hire, Recalio Rindoon, who will come up again later in The Dance of the Dragons. I don't want to spend too much time going through all of the Rogue Prince in great detail, this is the short version, but the point is that around the midpoint of that novella, this is still fairly in the middle of his career, uh, Daemon, now middle-aged, returns to the royal court and gets involved in several more political intrigues, setting up the Dance of the Dragons. Basically, one of the most powerful vassals of the Targaryens are House Valarian, a lesser Valyrian family that followed them to Westeros before the Doom destroyed their civilization. So over the generations, the Valarians became essentially the hereditary admirals in charge of the Targaryen fleet in the Narrow Sea. That These old vassals of the Targaryens, going back to the days in Valyria, they never had dragons, they were below the dragon lords, they were a vassal house, and they were in charge of the royal fleets. I'll talk more about them in upcoming videos when we get Valarian characters being cast in this, but the succinct thing is, Lord Corlys Valarian had two children, his son Laenor and his daughter Lena. Rhaenyra was pressured into an arranged marriage with Laenor, while Rhaenyra's uncle Daemon married her new husband's sister, Lena, to strengthen personal ties between Daemon, the Targaryens, and the Valarians. Later on, Laenor died in a political intrigue, and not long after that, Lena died in childbirth, after which Rhaenyra and her uncle Daemon remarried to each other. So originally she and her uncle had married a brother-sister pair, then they died, so they remarried to each other. I promise this is the most complicated family tree that's going to be in House of the Dragon. The other ones are very straightforward. That The rest are so much easier. Like, unlike Game of Thrones, where there were like three or four named characters from each of the nine great houses that you needed to know, like, well, here's Brynden Tully, but then here's Edmure Tully, and then here's Lysa. There's really only one or two from all the other houses. Like, there's one Stark you really need to know about, Cregan Stark. The Lannisters, there's three of them you really need to know about. Twin brothers and, and, this, and the wife of one of them. Uh, the Baratheons, you only need to know about Lord Boris Baratheon. He has daughters, you don't really need to know them, they're not big characters. But instead of it being evenly distributed, that, well, there's like three to four big characters in each of the great houses, there's fewer major characters in all of the great houses, but in the royal house, there's a lot of Targaryens. <laughs> because it's the story of a civil war within House Targaryen. And to be honest, the Greens, you know, Alicent's side, Aegon II's side, that's a lot more straightforward. Alicent had uh, four children with King Viserys, three sons and one daughter, and the eldest son, Aegon, married his own sister and had two children with him who, who aren't major characters. But you look at that, you go, oh, okay, Aegon, she had four children, two of them married. 
that straightforward. The Rainier part, though, that the, the family tree of the Blacks is really complicated. Don't worry about this now. We'll worry about it when they start casting all of their children. And will they cast all of them, or will they omit some for time? We're not sure. Short version is when Damon married Lena, he had twin daughters with her. Bela and Reyna, they are dragon riders, and they're sort of the Sansa and Arya of the story. While with Lainor, Rhaenyra had three sons from that marriage. Then after Lainor and Lena died, and they remarried to each other, Rhaenyra and Daemon had two more sons between themselves, who aren't important characters when the story begins, but they'll go on to become Aegon the Third and Viserys the Second. That, like in later seasons after time skips, like season seven, these will be important characters. Like think how Bran or Arya weren't doing that much in season one on a geopolitical scale, but like Aegon the Third becomes king eventually. So you don't need to. It's between the two of them, they have seven children from two separate marriages. So. The older sisters are the stepsisters, the other ones, but also cousins. You don't need to worry about this. And while there's seven of them, they're not all major characters at first. You know, they're starting off some of them young, who will grow into being major characters later. But don't worry about that too much now. We'll cover that when we actually start casting these characters. For now, it's Rhaenyra and her uncle married the brother-sister pair of Laenor and Lena Valarian both of whom later died, so they remarried to each other, and all three of these marriages produced children. Of course, I'd be remiss if I mentioned Daemon Targaryen without also mentioning his dragon, Caraxes the Bloodworm. Caraxes is officially my favorite dragon in the entire history of Westeros. And that includes Daenerys' dragons and the 20 living dragons during the Dance of the Dragons. He's my favorite of all of them. Caraxes is one of the largest of the second generation dragons. That There were originally three Targaryen dragons during the conquest, but they hatched another generation and there's another generation after that. There's four generations by the time of the dance, but the fourth gens, they're hatchlings. You can't ride them. They're too small at the time of the war. But Caraxes, he's one of the children of Beleriand and Meraxes and Vagar. And of the original three, Vagar is the last one that's still around. Meraxes died in Dorne, Beleriand died of old age eventually, the only one that did so. But by this point, Vagar, who is the smallest one during the dance, she's the only surviving one from the conquest. She's almost 200 years old, and she has grown to monstrous size almost as large as Beleriand was during the conquest itself. Now, Vagar is ridden by Aegon II's younger brother, and he's the biggest one on the green side. Caraxes is the most formidable dragon on the black side. And yes, they do eventually fight each other at the climax of the war, but that's many seasons away. That Caraxes is still described as one of the biggest second-gen dragons, and he is by far the most battle-hardened of any living dragon. Sort of a plot point is that most of these second and third generation dragons have never seen real combat, real warfare, barring dust-ups with pirates or skirmishes in the Dornish marches. There's been an 80-year era of peace, so, other than Vagar, who fought during the conquest and the Faith Militant Uprising, th there were one or two other dragons present during the Faith Militant Uprising, which was a generation after the conquest with Magor. But while Vermithor, Silverwing, and Dreamfire were alive at that time, they were not nearly big enough to fight in it. So, they saw no combat. So, on top of that, Vagar hasn't seen real combat in a long time. Caraxes has been with Daemon during all of his wars and battles in the last couple of years. 
Caraxes is the most battle-hardened dragon, saw extensive combat for a full nine years during the Pirate Wars and the Stepstones. That Daemon couldn't raise a large mercenary army, so he had to rely heavily on his dragon quite a bit in battle. So by the time of the dance, Caraxes isn't just one of the largest dragons, he's also the fiercest, the most fearless and the most bloodthirsty. His scales are blood red and covered with faint scars from half a hundred battles, but they don't call him the blood worm for his color. It, it's a joke. It's, he, they call him the blood worm for all the blood he spilled. Caraxes is the dragon you put on the cover of a death metal album. And I've, okay, I have come to loathe the word badass because Benioff and Weiss used it to endlessly describe Arya Stark in later seasons. It became this thought-terminating cliché. They go, we're making this show badass. And well, if by badass you mean throwing crap on screen that's poorly edited that we can't even see because you can't get lighting right, or plot hole, and, and there's plot holes everywhere, and the, the strategy makes no sense, what you and I think are badass are two separate things. And just, sorry, if you listen to the Blu-ray commentary, it's them endlessly going, like the instant Arya shows up on screen, Benioff going, Arya, badass! Just, Arya is badass. Arya badass. It's like he left the is out at a certain point. It, that's not her name. Her name isn't Arya badass. So I don't like using that word too much. But for Caraxes, I'm willing to make a goddamn big exception. He's that cool. So Vagar is the biggest and most feared dragon on Aegon II's side in the war. Caraxes is the most powerful and feared dragon on Rhaenyra's side. To the point that armies just surrender or run. You just drop your weapons and run at the mere arrival of Caraxes on the battlefield. Harren Hall surrenders to him without a fight because he shows up with Caraxes. They know it's suicidal to fight him. But as we get new casting sheets, I should also cover the dragons associated with each new Targaryen. And there's 20 of them, so this is going to be a whole chart. I'll probably have to make a separate video on this. I'm trying to keep this relatively restrained for now and relevant to the character I'm talking about. But thinking on it, okay, Daemon has Caraxes. Last video where I talked about the Rhaenyra casting, I skipped over talking about her dragon. I just showed a, a picture of it. Going back a bit, then, Rhaenyra's dragon is named Cyrax, and she's yellow, and she's nearly as big as Caraxes, though not nearly as experienced in battle. It, they don't explain this too clearly in the written text, but she's a queen dragon. She's an, a prolific egg layer that... He mentions it in passing, I'm not sure what that means, but multiple third-generation dragons were bred from Cyrax and Caraxes, and you were pretty sure that all of the dragons of Rhaenyra's sons come from that pairing. And it's weird where they go, like, dragons aren't intelligent like people are, or maybe it's a different kind of consciousness that's more attuned to nature or magic in a way we don't understand. That There's time when they go, oh, they, they're saying they're as intelligent as men. Well, sometimes they do surprisingly intelligent things, and you wonder what's going on here. It's like when you have a cat where it doesn't do what you want it to do doesn't mean it doesn't comprehend. that Their their mind is on a magical level or something. So we don't know what like the social dynamic between dragons is, that at times it seems like they just fight each other all the time, but sometimes, like, like crows, they form mated pairs that Cyrax became the permanent mate of Caraxes, or at least as long as their riders like each other. We're not sure how that works. Uh, another big example of this getting ahead of myself is Vermithor and Silverwing, who were the dragons that belonged to old King Jaehaerys and Alysan. They are very much a mated pair and have been so for a hundred years. And it's some line about that they, they're they still breeding. They oft coil about each other on, on the dragon mount. So it's weird that there are canon couples of dragon. And it's, well, how does that work? Because other times they seem hostile to all other dragons. And they'll be nice to people who are friends with their mate. So we don't know how that works. But Cyrax and Caraxes are the two big ones on Rhaenyra's side along with Melis. But we'll get into that later.
Well, everything I've been going over in this video up to this point has just been generic introduction for all the new people who might not have read the prequel novellas yet or collected in Fire and Blood, just to let you know how important and awesome Daemon Targaryen is. He's a grey character like Tyrion. He's like Tyrion wrapped up with Jaime and Tywin, but in the style of Oberyn Martell. But what did this new leaked casting sheet actually say? A little bit of background here. Uh, you might have seen you've been following my channel. Last week I had a video up on this which I have taken down because I was saying I don't think this casting sheet is true, but it actually was. I, I was hesitant to really go with it at first, and not just me, other news sites like winterscoming.net said, this is so detailed we don't think it can be real. And it wasn't confirmed by the usual sites that do this for us that there's this big fan site for Netflix's The Witcher series, Redanian Intelligence, and we know they have contacts in the casting industry and between casting agencies they usually check on when casting sheets go out. This leaked report was put out by a different news site, The Illuminerdy, and I said I'm not willing to believe in this until Redanian Intelligence confirms it through their sources. Then after that video, they did confirm it. Yeah, this is real. Everyone was a little hesitant at first, not just me, but other news sites. But okay, it's real. And I was a little behind on other stuff, and now I'm catching up. And I put out this big warning in the, in the video I took down that moving forward, guys, we're going to be dealing with fake casting reports like we had in Game of Thrones Seasons 1 to 3, where it's really just someone wanting to seem important by going, oh yeah, they'll cast this book character, which is really a wish list or something. Like, people saying, oh, we heard that they're going to cast the Tyrell brothers later in Season 4, and maybe they were toying with the idea at best, or it's completely made up. That it's a new show, people are going to leak out things, and we know at a certain point, minor characters will be trimmed for time, which is reasonable for a TV show. Benioff and Weiss took advantage of our tolerance for cutting characters by, like, season five, where it got really crazy. But, you know, like, maybe you could argue why you don't really need the Garland and Willis Tyrell, the older brothers. But we're going to be running into fake reports, and you can check that out on mainstream news sites. You can Google that. I'm not just reporting to you, wow, I heard this. The purpose of my channel is for analysis, not just unfiltered repeating things, right? So I'm letting you know now that I'm only going to discuss these casting sheets once they get confirmed by a reliable news site, specifically Redanian Intelligence, who have a pretty good track record, and we get the feeling you're going to be telling us most of these, that they're on top of that. So if you see it confirmed in Redanian Intelligence, possibly another source who goes, we heard this from insiders or other, like, winter is coming or something, then I'll report on it. But I'm not going to go with, oh, there's a rumor. So that's why I held off on this until we got behind the scenes confirmation, and we did, so here we are. All that context out of the way, what did this casting sheet say that Redanian Intelligence confirmed? Prince Daemon Targaryen, male. 40 to 50. The younger brother to King Viserys, Daemon wasn't born with naked ambition for the throne, despite being in line for it. He's less methodical and more impetuous, not to mention easily bored, stumbling from one distraction to the next. With the subconscious yet singular obsession with earning the love and acceptance of his brother the king. Hmm. Most of Daemon's joy is found at sword point, but even as the most experienced warrior of his time, he vacillates between vile and heroic, making him the true rogue of the series. The casting sheet also mentioned filming within the calendar year 2021 from January to December. That doesn't mean they're literally filming that long. It means beyond call for if they film in the spring beyond call through December in case we need some pickup shots, that that's normal. But we already knew from the Rhaenyra casting sheet they said filming in 2021, so don't read into that more. It's, it's going to be filming in 2021 at some point. I don't know how the pandemic's going to affect that. Will they film the spring or the fall? I have no idea. But that they're trying to film next year and aiming for 2022, and we'll see how the pandemic goes. But that isn't 
that's to be expected, having filming delays due to the pandemic. Now, there's two big points to bring up from this, though. First, a question of timeline, that in the Rhaenyra casting sheet, I noticed that it said casting in her early 20s, even though at the start of the war itself, first page of Princess and the Queen, Rhaenyra is 32 when her father dies. So it seemed like they were casting for a younger Rhaenyra, about a decade younger, which already in my previous video I said this indicates they're probably going to go with starting season one adapting the rogue prince, not diving right into the middle of the war. And that's really the right way to do it. The other options were start with the war and have extended flashback scenes, or have people just give info dumps, verbal exposition, well, this is why Alice and Rhaenyra don't like each other, this is what happened with Kristen Cole and Harwin Strong and all this other stuff, and if I had a choice, I would do this, just start with Rogue Prince, simply because it's easier for a new audience to grasp. You can do that in a book, you can't do that in a TV show, that many flashbacks would be too confusing, this is the most straightforward way to present it all. And on top of that, Martin always intended for these novellas to be read in chronological order. That maybe I'm I'm just too deep into it that I read Princess and the Queen when it came out in 2013, which was seven years ago, and we had to get used to realizing Rogue Prince isn't a prequel to Princess and the Queen. It was a sample taken out of order. That if you pick up Fire and Blood, the collected book now, you'll read Rogue Prince before you read Princess and the Queen, those chapters. So this isn't even an issue that came up, so I'm probably overthinking this, of getting people to stop thinking of Rogue Prince as a prequel to the dance. It's the setup for the dance. You have to read it first, otherwise you wouldn't know who the heck any of the characters are. This is different from, like, um, if you were arguing that Game of Thrones Season 1 should be Robert's Rebellion, no, there are structural reasons you shouldn't do that, because as you go further in the books, you're peeling back layers and learning more about Robert's Rebellion, and it's supposed to be a revelation. It's supposed to be a revelation that Jamie Lannister actually killed the Mad King to save King's Landing from the Wildfire plot, and it was a very good thing he did. That's supposed to be a surprise in Book 3. Or that Jon Snow's father is really Rhaegar Targaryen, that's supposed to be a surprise later. Imagine if they showed that in order. It wouldn't have had nearly as much impact. Imagine if we didn't have seven years of people asking, who is Jon Snow's mother at every damn convention panel Q&A, as if they're going to tell them live, you know? So th there's reasons not to do that. Or, or like Harry Potter, where as you go forward, you peel back layers of the first conflict with Voldemort and who betrayed who and who was secretly on whose side. Many books are structured like this, where you're peeling back layers. Dance of the Dragons isn't like Game of Thrones, isn't like that with Robert's Rebellion. You were supposed to read Rogue Prince first, and Fire and Blood restored it like that. So fine, and there would still be action in Season 1. You'd see dragons fighting pirates, but it'd be a build-up to that, and laying the groundwork. And think about it, Game of Thrones Season 1 didn't have huge action set pieces, full-scale battles, I mean, in it. You had to make all the setup as who was fighting who, then the actual war began in Season 2, with Rob leading his armies in the Riverlands. So you need to have setup. You can't just dive in. Otherwise, people wouldn't know what the heck you're talking about. So fine, I would be arguing for them to do Rogue Prince, and thankfully, the fact that they're casting a Rhaenyra ten years younger than she should be seemed to indicate that. Well, in this casting report, they said we're looking for a Daemon who's 40 to 50. Daemon is 48 at the start of the war, when his brother the king dies. So just like with the Rhaenyra casting sheet, they're looking for someone maybe a decade younger. And this leads to an open question I'm going to leave you guys with. This is something I would ask the writers, and not in an accusatory way. Rogue Prince covers 30 years. There's time skips in it. How are you going to handle that? Like Dawson casting, where you have actors playing their younger selves, I can see a 20-something actress, Rhaenyra, for one or two scenes playing teenaged Rhaenyra with makeup, with costuming, and they're faking it just for the sake of continuity. 
because it's cameo for their later, all right, 10 years later, here's Rhaenyra in the next episode. You can do that, but like when she she's six years old at the beginning of it, would you cast a child actress? I wouldn't rule out that they're also going to cast a young Rhaenyra for like one episode, but before season one is over, we'll see the main Rhaenyra actress who will continue through the rest of the show and age into the role that, well, by season two, she'll be closer to her 30s that way. So just how will you address that some of the older characters will do that, and even Allison, she's like a teenager at the beginning of it, that these casting sheets do seem to be for the main ones. The, the Allison one said she's only a few years older than Rhaenyra, which is true. Would the first few episodes do that differently? bit harder with Daemon, because he's even older, but whatever the case, in some fashion they're starting with Rogue Prince, and I don't know how they're going to handle that with casting, which is fine, we need that setup. Second big point is that whole line about subconsciously trying to earn his brother's acceptance and approval. This casting sheet refers to his older brother as if he's still alive. That if we jumped into the first page of The Princess and the Queen, Viserys is on his deathbed, he's just died. Why would they talk about Daemon trying to win his acceptance if he's dead? So that really indicates to me, you know, Viserys will be a character in this. He's not just going to be playing a corpse like, like John Aaron was in the first episode of Game of Thrones. No, we'll actually see what's going on here. Which is fine, this is how I would do it. And this is the last thing I want to get to, picking this apart. The one thing that strikes me from this as, hmm, that's not how I describe it, saying he's a hero and a villain, heroic and vile, greatest warrior of his generation, impetuous, all of that describes him from the books. It's that line about subconsciously seeking his brother's approval, which is curious. The books never say that in as many words, though it isn't necessarily wrong either. So I'm really looking forward to everyone's discussion in the comments section on this, everyone who's actually read it already, if you've read Fire and Blood or the novellas. Would you describe Daemon like that with Viserys? Because it's that whole... I can see how they could go with that. It's an outline they're filling in, and maybe George R. R. Martin told them other stuff. Though, when Benioff and Weiss were changing things in Season 2, we kept thinking... Uh, maybe George R. R. Martin told them stuff that wasn't in the book, like Cersei having another baby, and it's, no, you wanted Lena Headey to give a monologue about having a baby that died. It had nothing to do with the storyline. They quickly kind of forgot about it. But in this case, because Fire and Blood is an outline, overtly, you know, it's an outline, he said, like, one, of, one chapter could sustain three books. There are things... Quite certainly, Martin will be filling them in on as a consultant. Well, I didn't have time to put that in. We'll have to be careful about that. You know, what exactly was the dynamic between Viserys and Daemon, as we saw or could glean from the print version of these novellas? I can kind of see that working. That Well, think about it. The classic trope of older responsible sibling and younger wild child who's just running around doing stuff, like Sansa and Arya. Sansa's the older, more responsible one. Or Duran Martell and Oberyn Martell. You know, just as Daemon is based on Oberyn, Viserys is in many ways sort of like Duran, except a happy version of Duran, that, well, he's the mature, solid, doesn't get into any crazy hijinks one where Daemon's running around doing all sorts of stuff, because I'm not the king of people, I don't care what people think. So it's like that, where does Arya hate Sansa? No, like when you see her in her thought monologue in, in certain books, where she goes, she even misses Sansa, That the whole sibling rivalry thing. They do love each other. This isn't like where, this isn't a Gregor and Sandor Clegane situation. No, it's like Duran and Oberyn, where they butt heads, but they really love each other. And we see that in the Rogue Prince, the text of it, that Daemon does deeply infuriating, even reprehensible things, just in his youth, that deeply offend Viserys. Or sometimes they even result in Daemon being temporarily exiled to the Free Cities, where they go, you are exiled for five years. 
And Viserys is presented as being entirely reasonable for doing so. For, look, the High Towers are really mad at you. I am mad at you. We're going to exile you for five years. You can't keep doing this. And you're on his side. Daemon did something really questionable. You know, Daemon is this larger-than-life rogue adventurer. But there are also points when Daemon returns and willingly submits to his brother and asks his forgiveness for no other reason or ulterior motive than that he fundamentally does love his brother and doesn't want to keep fighting with him, underneath all that friction. So it has its ups and downs on a scale of 30 years. You know, for older adults, think of how many ups and downs that you've had with in your relationship with siblings. So I wouldn't say it's an entirely wrong description. That You could say that Daemon carving out a pirate kingdom in the Stepstones, you could say, well, maybe that was him trying to win his brother's approval by doing something really impressive. And on the other hand, a big part of Daemon's actions is that before Viserys had sons with Alicent, he wanted Viserys to make him his heir. So there are points in Rogue Prince when he is desperately trying to get on his brother's good side to be the heir, and it goes back and forth. You can see this. I want to know how they're playing this. You could read into that, so let's keep an eye on that. I hope they're not making something up. But on the other hand, I wouldn't say that's inaccurate. I look forward to what everyone says in the comments. that It's not inaccurate. I want to go over that. This is the first real thing of substance we have on how Fire and Blood would be handling characters and their relationships. And, oh my god, look! Book fandom having a real discussion about adapting a book relationship. We haven't been doing this since before 2015. <laughs> of, well, how would you portray, like, the Sansa Arya dynamic or the Tyrion Jamie dynamic on screen? Now we're dealing with, well, how would you portray the Viserys Daemon dynamic? <laughs> this is great. It's This is something utterly removed from the nonsense of Benioff and Weiss, and just, hey, how would I adapt Fire and Blood from my interpretation of it as a book? So at first I found that description a little off-putting, but the more I thought about it, the more I thought, well, yeah, I, maybe that's how they're going with this. I can see that. I wonder who they'll cast next, because there are some obvious choices like Aegon II and Aemond, but the younger you get, if they're starting with Rogue Prince, Amond is a teenager. Would they even cast the same person who would be in Season 2? And then you wonder about, well, who will they cut? That we don't need Brynden Hightower. He's not a major character. But I really hope they don't cut out Bela and Reyna. That when they made that 20-minute animated uh, histories and lore in Season 5 for The Dance of the Dragons... It was only 20 minutes long, and it was like you were watching a 20-minute supercut of the first three seasons of Game of Thrones focused on Rob, Catelyn, and Cersei, but leaving out Stannis, or the Ironborn. Which, for 20 minutes, you, you couldn't fit that in any way. That The 20-minute featurette didn't mention that Bela and Reyna exist at all. When there's a surprisingly active, you know, online book fandom and on Twitter, there's fan art of Bela and Reyna. They're major characters. But that was a 20-minute video. I'm pretty sure that a full series would include Bela and Reyna. They are major characters for a long time. I mean, they're teenagers now. You know, even even in the beginning of the thing, they're, they're around and they have drag. They're both dragon riders and they do stuff. Would they condense some of her sons together? I don't see how they could. So. There's certain characters you could cut, and I and I go well. Even I would cut that out, just as a as a normal person discussing. Like, do we need every single guardsman in King's Landing? No, but there's certain characters you go. You might want to cut that character just for time, because it's eating up time that could be devoted to other characters. And like, which storylines can they fit? Which ones can't they fit? It, they need to have a plan, not do what Game of Thrones did, where in Season 5, on a whim, they decided to shove Dorne in, and they acted like it was our fault of, well, how are we to know you couldn't fit in something with more than a year's prep time? Like, since Season 1, and then on a daily basis, 365 days in a row, during Season 2, we were going, why aren't you setting up Jane Poole? Why aren't you setting up Jane Poole? 
Why aren't you setting up Dorn? Why aren't you setting up Dorn? And they ignored us, and people laughed that, oh, you're getting too far ahead of yourself. The biggest problem on Game of Thrones is they didn't have a plan on an adaptation where they already had an outline. Martin told them the outline of future things. And I have this whole chart, I've explained this, that every major change to the show, or even stupid thing, was a snap decision made the year it happened. Like, are you killing the Night King? They admitted, oh yeah, we came up with that when we were making Season 7. Like, you need to be planning now which major characters you intend to cut by Season 3. Because there isn't enough time to juggle that many characters. Like, I don't think we need Brynden Hightower. He's just the best knight in the Servants of the Hightowers. He fights in their army. You probably do need Ormond Hightower, who's the Lord of House Hightower, because they're important politically. But I hope we get Bela and Reyna, but if they're starting with Rogue Prince, they probably haven't been born yet in the first season. Or maybe by the end, but even if they did, they'd be child actors who they'd recast for season two or something. Many questions this raises. And on top of that, separate issue I'm going to close on, Bela and Reyna are stated to be identical twins. So are they going to, you know, cast one actress to play both of them? You plausibly could do that because they're not in the first season that much. Like, they become more important later. And in the Long Night prequel, it turns out they actually did cast an identical twin sister pair for a, a role we're not sure what it was. Or are they just going to cast two actresses that look like they're really closely resembling each other like sisters? But... How do you cast identical twins like that for such a major role? Wonderful questions that don't involve complaining about Game of Thrones, but just, hey, how do we move forward with this? Very exciting times. And for all I know, I could wake up tomorrow and we could get a casting sheet for, like, Otto Hightower or Kristen Cole or something. I'm looking forward to all of this. I hope again. Still, Daemon Targaryen. Caraxes. Well, tell me what you guys make of all this in the comments.